how fast you are. Hello. I'm impressed how fast you are. Yeah, I didn't hear it. didn't hear it. I just changed the link. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, give me one minute. I need to prepare for the seminar. I just want to uh, see the list of the tasks I want to discuss with you today. So. Dim. Yes. Are you going to post a demo demo variant of our final test? No, there will be no demo variant uh, because well, your demo variant is your homework. If you know how to solve all the problems from the homework task, then you are prepared for the test. Because so we can find everything from a homework. Yeah. Okay. Homework. okay. So I mean, because the. Um, uh, well, how to say, um, what is the purpose of the test? I want to check if you know how to solve some, well, some, some specific problems from a specific list of problems. And this specific list of, the list of problems is exactly uh, the problems we taught you during the seminars and we asked you to solve during your homework. So if you know how to solve everything in your homework, you will not have any troubles with the test. Okay, oh, as, as I can see. <laughs> we can start. Only four of us here, but that's okay. okay. I think it's a number of people who solve the homework. What again? It's a number of people who solve the, the homework. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, I, I mean, for me, it's impossible how, for me, it's impossible to solve homework without attending the seminar. I see. Okay, so I think we should start. So let me start the, yeah, I need to start a new whiteboard, even if it's black. Yeah, that's an interesting terminology. It's called whiteboard, if you don't, use a piece of choke and it's called white a blackboard if you use a piece of choke so here well this is actually a whiteboard just in case 
I like the terminology. Okay, so here the chat. This yeah. is me. May I ask you to um, somehow highlight the tasks more explicitly so that uh, it it was easier to distinguish them when we check the similar notes. Oh, you you want me to, to highlight the I, 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 I Yeah, I mean, ju just when we switch from task one to task two, uh, write it somehow more explicitly, underline it or something like that. Because, well, sometimes it's quite quite difficult to understand uh, which line belongs to which task. Oh, okay, I, I see what you mean. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll try doing that. But just in case, if, if I forget uh, about doing that, uh, don't hesitate to re uh, remind me. I'll, okay. I'll do that. It's, I'm, not, I'm, not doing, I'm not doing this because I don't want to. I'm not doing it because I just forget uh, that you asked me to do that. Okay, so yeah, so let's discuss um, everything that we have learned during, during the lecture. So um, I want to make a quick overview. Oh yeah, by the way, I need to do this. Um, just one, one second more, I need one second more. Okay, so yeah, now we're ready. Um, so, what did we do during this lecture? Well, we discussed a way how to check if a set of polynomials is a Grodner basis or not. And then we discussed several algorithms related to Grodner basis. One of them is how to produce a Grodner basis generated in an ideal. And then uh, two problems at the end of the lecture is a membership problem and how to intersect an ideal with the polynomial ring. So I just want to practice in these uh, tasks today. So first of all, um, let's start with a simple task. So let's take a polynomial ring in four variables and let's take g to be x plus y, z plus w. So uh, this is a set of polynomials. Let's try to check that this um, set is a Grobner basis for any lexicographical order. So, for, uh, so what I want to prove is that for any lexicographical order, so here we have like four factorial orders, this is a Grobner basis. So how do we check this? Okay, so how do we check this for a specific order? Let's take a specific order for variables. Y is higher than, oh, X and higher than Y, higher than Z and higher than W. So now, what are the leading terms of these polynomials? So here is X and here is Z. Now, how do we check if this set is a Grobner basis or not? Uh, well, we need to, uh, um, take each pair here, and here is only one pair, the first and the second polynomial. Let's say this is G1 and this is G2. And we want to form the what's called S polynomial for each pair. And then we want to reduce this S polynomial uh, to a remainder and check if the remainder is zero or not. If the remainder is zero for each S polynomial, then this is a Grobner basis. If at least one remainder is not zero, uh, well, then it's not a Grobner base. In our case, we have only one pair. So we have only one S polynomial. So let's compute this S polynomial and then uh, ch uh, check if its remainder is zero or not. So what is the S polynomial? We take the first polynomial, we take the second one. Here is the leading term and here is the leading term. So we want to multiply these uh, two polynomials by monomials with coefficients such that their leading terms become uh, the same. So the first one should be multiplied by z and the second one should be multiplied by x because x times z is the least common multiple of their leading terms. And then we want to subtract one from another one. 
in order to cancel the leading terms. So the result will be zy minus xw. So this is the S polynomial of G1 and G2. And now we want to check if it's possible to reduce this polynomial to zero or not. Okay, let's try doing that. Uh, first of all, as you can see, we can reduce uh, these monomial with respect to G1. So how do we do that? Well, we take ZY minus XW, this is our initial polynomial, minus what is G1, X plus Y, and we want to multiply it by W in order to cancel this term. So at the end, we will get ZY minus WY. So this is one step of reduction. Now, is it possible to reduce this polynomial with respect to G1 any further? No, because there are no uh, monomials divisible by X. Okay, but there are monomials divisible by Z. Actually, there is only one monomial divisible by Z. This is this one. So we can reduce these monomials with respect to G2. How do we do that? We take- Multiply by Y. Yep. We take this one and we subtract uh, Z plus W. This is G2 multiplied by Y. Yep. So doing that, we can cancel the, these, these guys. And what do we have? We have minus WY from the first summon. Uh, and I'm sorry, uh, something went wrong. There must be a different sign here. Just give me one second. Um, um, what, what, what went wrong? Um, ZY minus... Uh, Um, come on, what's wrong? I'm um, sorry. Oh, here is the mistake, I see. There, there must be plus here because otherwise we cannot cancel this term. That was the mistake. So here we have plus, here we have plus here and we have plus here. So that was a mistake, I'm sorry for, for that. Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, yeah, uh, module or this mistake. So actually, re so uh, well, what, what, what was the mistake? Yeah, so here we have to cancel this guy, but since this the coefficient here is minus, so when we subtract, we need to multiply w by minus one also. So minus times minus gives you plus. So now here we have minus xw and here we have uh, plus xw, so they cancel each other, and here is how we get uh, the polynomial. So here we have plus wy. And so here we have plus wy, and when we, uh, yeah, and here when it's subtract in this case, so yeah, and here must be minus because here is plus. So now we can cancel the leading term, but uh, uh, the remaining terms are these. And as you can say, as you can see, we have y, uh, wy from the first guy and minus yw from the second one, and the result is zero. Yeah, I'm sorry for making a mistake, but as you can see, uh, well, everyone can make a mistake. So it's a very wise idea to check your computation. So, I mean, if you have enough experience, you just make mistakes r uh, rare. Your mistakes are rare, you, you, you make mistakes rarely. But uh, even if you have like a lot of experience, you still make mistakes. And that's one of, uh, of the problems uh, with people actually, <laughs> people do mistakes. They make they make mistakes. Okay, uh, so let me uh, so let me summarize what's what's going on here. So we we have taken this particular 
uh, order on variables. This gives us a lexicographical order on, the, on monomials. Uh, this, uh, so now we can um, uh, uh, underline the leading terms of these polynomials. And we can try to check if this um, set is a Grobner basis or not. How do we do that? We compute S polynomial for this pair. This is the S polynomial. And then we try to reduce it uh, with respect to this set. And as you can see, after reduction, we will get zero. So every S polynomial of every pair is reducible to zero. So because of that, uh, by the Bockberger criterion, this simply means that G is a Grobner basis for the lexicographical ordering where X is greater than Y is greater than D is greater than W. So this is how we check that this set is a Grobner basis with respect to one specific order. Uh, how do we check that this is a Grobner basis for every order? Well, you may go through all the possible orders. Uh, well, it's quite a lot of options actually. You have like four factorial, it's like four times six, 24 options. You, you, you should consider 24 cases. It's not that pleasant. Instead, you may use a different approach. Uh, is there anyone who sees how to do this automatically without any computation? Okay, so let me recall. Or take a set of remainders? No, no. Let me recall one, uh, uh, one remark. As you can see, uh, well, here, when, you, when we computed S polynomial of these two guys, how do we compute S polynomial? Well, we take the leading monomials. Uh, yeah, okay, let's look at leading monomials X and Z. So, so we need to compute the least common multiple of the leading monomials. It's, it will be the product here. So in our case, the, um, the leading monomials are co-prime. GCD of X and Z is one. Uh, during the lecture, I told you that if the leading monomials are co-prime, then their S polynomial is automatically reducible to zero. So in this case, G1 and G2 will be reducible to zero automatically with respect to these two guys because of this. So in order to prove, this is the claim from the lecture that it happens when the leading terms are um, co-prime. And we actually have checked in this particular case that uh, while X and Z are co-prime, um, uh, then uh, we can reduce it to zero. Okay, so now um, how to apply this knowledge in order to show that it happens for every order? Well, if you take an arbitrary order on monomials, then the leading term of this polynomial is either X or Y. And the leading term of this polynomial is either Z or W. In any case, the leading terms will be co-prime because all monomials in these polynomials are co-prime. So this condition uh, holds for, um, for every choice of the order. So the S polynomial will be reducible to zero for every choice of the order automatically because of this claim. Is it clear what, what's going on here? Yeah, but I have a question. Is it possible to get zero even if uh, like they're not comprime? Yeah, it's possible even if they're not comprime. Okay. In, in case when uh, uh, two poly, uh, well, for example, in case when two polynomials form a Grobner basis, then uh, the result will be zero. Okay, so now I want to discuss um, um, another example. So the next example is this. Suppose G consists of X, Y minus one and Y, Z minus one. So this is the example we have already seen during the lecture and during the previous seminar. So, and let's take uh, the order where X is higher than Y and higher than Z. Now I want to check if this set is a Grobner basis or not. And I want to apply a book bigger algorithm in order to find the Grobner basis. So first of all, let's so let's find so let's apply the Buchberger algorithm 
in order to extend this set to a Grobner basis. How, what do we do? Well, first of all, let's underline the leading terms. So now I want to apply the Buchbergel algorithm. So let's recall what does it do. So we need to uh, find all pairs. For each pair, we compute S polynomial. We reduce S polynomial uh, with respect to uh, the current set. And if we have at least one non-zero remainder, we, we take all the we'll take all non-zero remainder, add to our set, and then repeat the procedure. So okay, again, so what do we do? We should compute all S polynomials. So here we have only two polynomials, G1 and G2. So we need to compute only one S polynomial, G1 and G2, uh, S polynomial for G1 and G2. Let's do that. Well, how do we do this? Well, we need to compute the least common multiple of their, their leading uh, monomials. So the least common multiple will be x, y, z. And the first one should be multiplied by z. The second one should be multiplied by x. And we should subtract one from another one. Then we cancel the leading terms because of this. And the result will be x minus z. So this is S polynomial. And as you can see, it's not reducible with respect to g. It's a remainder with respect to g. So this set is not a Grobner basis. And what does the algorithm says? In this case, we should add this polynomial to the list of polynomials above. So these are the polynomials that we have from the beginning. And we add these polynomials to our set. So this is G1, G2, and G3. Let me underline the leading terms because X is higher than Y. So now we need to apply the algorithm again. Uh, now we have three different polynomials. Now we need to compute S polynomials, polynomials uh, of all the pairs. So we need to compute S polynomial of G1 and G2, S polynomial of G1 and G3, and we need to compute S polynomial of G2 and G3. And then we need to reduce them with respect to uh, this set of polynomials and find if all the uh, remainders are zero or not. Okay, let's do this. Well, S polynomial of G1 and G2, we have already computed. This is X minus Z. But now we have X minus Z in our disposal. It's G3. So with respect to G3, it's reduced to zero. And here is a remark. Well, actually, in this case, as you can see, well, we can divide the list of all polynomials into the old ones and the new ones. And it doesn't make sense to consider S polynomial of the old ones. Why? Because the S polynomial of the old ones we have already computed, and their remainder and there is added to our list as the new one. So we can reduce this S polynomial to its remainder and then using the remainder, we can reduce it to zero. So we can always find a way to reduce an S polynomial of older ones with respect to the older ones and the new remainders that were added. So actually uh, this part was unnecessary. So uh, what we actually need to do, uh, well, yeah, we did this, but I wanted to demonstrate that it works. But I hope you have noted that the, uh, uh, when we compute S polynomials of, uh, in the red zone, uh, we will always get a polynomial which is reducible by something from the yellow zone. So, and this will happen in general. So you can skip this part. So you may skip um, S polynomials of the other ones. So now let's compute uh, yeah, but just in case, are there any questions regarding this remark? Why we can skip the red, the red part? No. Okay, so now um, uh, let's uh, pr uh, proceed with computation. So now we need to compute S polynomial of G1 and G3. 
So here we have x, y minus one, it's G1, and x minus z, it's, G, it's G3. Uh, so here, we need, uh, what is the, yeah, so the leading monomials are these ones. So we need to multiply by y and subtract one from another one. Yeah, so uh, let me postpone this. So uh, the result will be here, we have this and this, and the result will be y, z, minus one. And as you can see, this is exactly G2. So using G2, we can reduce it to zero. So uh, the second S polynomial is also reducible to zero. And now we need to compute S polynomial of G2 and G3. But we can, uh, we can skip this also, why? Because the leading term of, let me write uh, them down here, Y Z minus one and X minus Z. So the leading term here is yz, the leading term here is x. They are co-prime. So we don't need to compute uh, uh, the remaining s polynomial since the leading terms are co-prime, this guy will automatically be reduced to zero with respect to g2 and g3. So the only computation that we, uh, we really need to do here is this one. And as you can see, all the S polynomials are reducible to zero. Now, this set is a Grodner basis. And this was uh, an example of the uh, Buchberger algorithm to find a Grodner basis. So it may happen that you need several steps. So now the algorithm terminates at the second, uh, at, at, after the first step. Uh, so it terminates on the second step. But it may happen, you, you may need more steps than, than just one. Okay, are there any questions regarding this uh, task? Okay, now, um, what is important that it may happen that uh, one set can be Grobner basis for one uh, specific order and it's, and it's not a Grobner basis for another, uh, another order. So let's uh, discuss the example. Oh yeah, you asked me to clarify um, the, the border between two different tasks. So the, the, here we switch to a different task. Yeah, I'll try to remember that. It's hard for me to keep this in mind, but okay, I hope I won't forget. I'll try my best. So again, we want to deal with this polynomial ring, rational coefficients and three variables. And let's take G to be X square Y minus Y square and X square Z minus Z square. So now I want to uh, check two different orders. The first order, is lex where z is higher than y and higher than x. And the second case is the opposite lexicographical order where x is higher than y and higher than z. Let's check if g is a Grobner basis for these two orders. Okay, let's start from the first one. Uh, well, in the first case, uh, what is the leading term uh, with respect to this order of the first polynomial. Can you tell me? What? Uh, what is the leading what is the leading term here with respect to this order? Y square. Y square. Okay. What is the leading term of the second polynomial with respect to this order? Z square. Z square. And now, as you can see, y square and z square, they are co-prime. So because of the lemma, um, uh, their S polynomial must uh, be reducible to zero. So in this case, G is a Grobner basis. So it's simple. You, as you can see, um, um, well, the way the order was chosen is uh, that these two um, monomials become um, the leading terms. Now let's check the other um, order. Uh, in this case, the leading terms are different 
and the leading terms are these ones. Let's check if it's a Grobner basis or not. So I, I just want to repeat this polynomials. Oh, oh no, I have enough place. So how do we check? Well, we need to compute the S polynomial. In this case, the polynomials are these ones. These are the leading terms. So what is the least common multiple of the leading monomials? It's x squared by z. Ah, okay. Yeah, so now we multiply this by z, this one by y, we subtract. Due to this uh, thing, we can cancel the leading terms. And the s polynomial will be y z square uh, minus z y square. So this, this is um, um, the S polynomial. And as you can see, it doesn't depend on X. So it's not reducible. So it's a remainder with respect to G. So you cannot reduce it to zero with respect to G. This means that G is not a Grobner basis with respect to the, uh, the other order. So the same set can be a Grobner basis with respect to some order, and it can be, it cannot be a Grobner, uh, it may happen that it's not a Grobner basis with respect to a different order. So keep this in mind. It's very important to specify an order. And if, it's does, and if it doesn't matter which order to use in your problem, you may use uh, the order which is uh, more convenient. Well, if you can, if you see that you can uh, choose the order in such a way that uh, the set becomes Grobner basis, well, choose the the, uh, the corresponding order. So, uh, for example, uh, in the membership problem, you may choose any order you wish. So, it, uh, in in case you solve a membership problem, uh, you, you can choose uh, whatever order you want. Okay. Now, uh, let's try to compute the Grobner basis in this case. So uh, let's apply the Buchberger algorithm uh, to the set using this order. So after the first step, we will get a larger set, which is this one. And here, which, uh, okay, here I want to replace this polynomial by minus this polynomial. It doesn't change anything. I just want to, yeah, so uh, here is one remark. Instead of adding this polynomial to our set, I can add minus this polynomial to our set. Uh, I mean, this doesn't change anything. It's it, because you can multiply each polynomial by a constant. So um, it's, you're allowed to do that. So I just want to um, underline several tweaks to the original algorithm and you can use them. Uh, why did I switch the sign? Because I want the leading term to be with coefficient one. When x is higher than y and higher than z, the leading term here will be this one. And this part consists of old polynomials and this part consists of new polynomials. So now we want to compute, uh, in order to check if this is a Grobner basis, we need to compute as polynomials of the first polynomial and the third polynomial and S polynomial of the third polynomial and the second polynomial. Okay, so this is one and this is two. But when you look at, oh, no, uh, in all cases, they are not co-prime, okay. So now we have to compute all the S polynomials, so G1 and G3. So here we have x square y minus y square and y square z minus y z square. Here are the leading terms. What is the least common multiple? The least common multiple uh, of the leading terms is, well, x square y square z. So we need to multiply the first one by y z and the second one by x square, if I'm correct. Yeah. And now we can subtract one from another one. And this will be the S polynomial for G1 and G3. So what is the result? So these are canceled. 
and uh, here we will get x square y z square minus y cube z. Okay, this is the S polynomial. And now we want to um, uh, reduce it with respect to uh, these guys. Okay, um, which, uh, okay, let's try to reduce it with respect to G1. Okay. Um, let's try to reduce with respect to G1. So we have X square Y, Z square minus Y cube Z minus, what is G1? Z square, we need Z square G1. Again? We need Z square G1. This, yeah, okay, yeah, you're right, Z square G1. In this case, we cancel this guy. And what will we get? Uh, we will get, y square z square minus y cube z. Okay, and now um, we want to reduce this one. Is it possible to reduce? Yep, we can use g3. And what it does, what does it actually do? It um, replaces y square z by y z square. Okay, let's do this. Let's use g3 and we have two options. Uh, what what is g3? It's y square z, and we can reduce either this either this monomial or this one. Let's try to reduce the second one. Let's try to reduce this guy with respect to g3. What will we get here? One. Zero. Yep, exactly. So. In order to reduce this, I want to multiply this. Uh, oh, uh, I, I used the wrong um, powers. So in order to reduce this guy, we need to multiply the leading term by y and subtract. Then as you can see, we cancel these things. And as a result, we will get y square z square minus y square z square. So the result is zero. So we have found a way to reduce this polynomial to zero. Well, if we were not accurate uh, or not observant enough and we reduce this thing, well, the sequence of reductions leading to zero uh, would be larger. So it's uh, very important to, well, I mean, it, it's not a big deal. You will get um, a longer computation chain, but in general, um, you will get a, a right answer. But here, uh, uh, well, as you can see, when you reduce uh, using this polynomial, um, you replace y square z but by y z square. So it simply means I mm, decrease the degree of y to, to the second degree and I increase the degree of z, z to the second degree. And after this modification, I can cancel this term with this one. So this is the reason why I applied the reduction to the second term and not to the first one. Um, excuse me, uh, shouldn't there be y squared z squared plus y squared z squared? Because oh. there are two minuses. Oh, you're right. You're right. I'm... And before that, actually, um, yeah. we have, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we even multiply into brackets and there um, it's, it's higher. I guess there is one more mistake I wanted to ask. Shouldn't it? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, there is no, uh, it, it must be zero. The mistake was here. Uh, again, oh. there must be plus, not minus, because if I use minus, I don't cancel this leading term. The result will be zero. Uh, I see. Um, yeah, but thanks uh, for the uh, notification. Yeah. And yeah, before that, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, but there is like minus x squared multiplied by these brackets. And shouldn't there be x squared multiplied by y? Where? Here? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, because you see, um, what are the leading terms here? Here it's x squared y, and here is y z squared. What, uh, uh, what is the least common multiple of these two monomials? Well, we need to take x in the second power, Mm -hmm. We need to take y in the second power, not the third power, not the product, but the least common multiple. Here we need to take 
the, uh, the second power. And mm -hmm. then we take Z in, this, in the first power. Now, now you can see, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so, thank you. So you do not multiply these monomials. You find the least common multiple of these two monomials and multiply by um, the required part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This this is the second <laughs> computational mistake during <laughs> this seminar. Okay, I'm getting too old for this shit. Um, yeah. So let's check the uh, the second pair. So in this case, we consider these two mon uh, these two polynomials. Oh, yeah. It's hard to remember, but I'll try. So. Uh, Oh, wrong color. S G two G three. What is uh, G two? It's x square z uh, minus z square, and uh, G three is y square z minus uh, y z square. Now, what is the least common multiple of their leading monomials? So, x y z x should be in the second degree. Uh, for y, we should take the second degree and z, yes, the first degree. Now, we should multiply this one by y square and this one by x square and then subtract. And yes, because of this, we can cancel the leading terms. Yeah. So now what remains is the s polynomial, which is x square y z square minus y square z square. So this is the S polynomial for G2 and G3. And now we want to check if we can reduce it to zero. Let's try doing that. Uh, well, I want to try reduction with respect to G1. So uh, with respect to G, uh, what, what do we do with respect to G1? Well, we actually, well, X square Y Z square minus Y square Z square is the initial polynomial. And we want to subtract X, square y minus x square and we want to cancel these these term by this one well here we should multiply by z square and now we can cancel this term and as you can see what remains is actually zero because we have y square z square plus y square z square so the result is also zero so we have found a way to reduce this s polynomial to zero so all S polynomials here are reducible to zero, the first and the one, the, uh, the first and the second one. So this is the Grobner basis. So this is the Grobner basis. So this is how the algorithm works. So this was the second um, uh, example of how to apply the Buchberger algorithm to extend uh, a set of polynomials to a Grobner basis. Yeah, I'm sorry for the computational mistakes. I hope uh, it didn't make things less clear. Are there any questions regarding this algorithm? Okay, but one of the most important remarks is this. Uh, be careful. Uh, the fact if G is a Grobner basis or not depends on the choice of the algorithm. Sometimes it, uh, it's a Grobner basis and for the other, uh, or is it's not okay now um, the next thing i want to discuss um, a membership problem uh, and the other problems the membership problem and how to intersect um, uh, an ideal with a subring well here um well if we want to well and, and here is the fir first remark. So I, I, I believe we can we can switch. Oh, we can switch to this part. So let me recall what is a membership problem. So membership problem uh, is this: we are given an ideal in a polynomial ring, not necessarily the same amount of variables, um, and we have a polynomial here. And we want to check if this polynomial belongs to the ideal. So in this case, if you want to um, solve this problem, 
Well, you may choose any order uh, on your variables and then compute the Grobner basis of i and then compute the, the remainder of f with respect to your Grobner basis. So the steps are this. First of all, you, uh, you fix an order. Second, you compute Grobner basis of i. So you apply the Buchberger algorithm. Uh, Buchberger, Buchberger algorithm to compute a Grobner basis. Let's say G0. And then you compute a remainder of F with respect to, G, to G0. And there are two options. If the remainder is zero, then F is inside I. And if the remainder is not zero, then F is not inside I. So this is how you solve the problem. And as you can see, it doesn't matter which order you use. For example, in the previous, uh, previous task, when we, have, uh, when we had this um, uh, sophisticated set of polynomials, um, well, let's write it here. So in the previous task, we had Q of X, Y, Z, and we could take an ideal I to be X square Y minus Y square, uh, comma X square Z minus Z square. And now uh, we want to check if a polynomial uh, belongs uh, to this ideal or not. Well, for example, we want to check something like X cube Y Z, if it's belong to this set or not. Well, actually let's consider something more complicated, something like plus X. Let's do something like this. You see, here it doesn't matter which order to choose. And for example, I can take uh, the order from the first uh, uh, from the first case where we, I can take the geographical order where z is higher than y and higher than x. In this case, these are the leading terms, and this set is already a Grobner basis. And now. Uh, because we know that uh, since z square and y square are co-prime, their s polynomial will be reducible to zero automatically. And now uh, we want to check if this polynomial is in this ideal or not. How do we check this? We need to compute a remainder of this polynomial with respect to this Grobner basis. But as you can see, every monomial here is not divisible by y square and z square. It's neither divisible by this one nor this one. So this is already a remainder. And it's not zero. So this polynomial is not in our ideal. So as you can see, the, the, the problem can be solved very easily. So it's really easy to solve this problem if we choose this specific order. Are there any questions regarding this um, part of the problem? Okay, I hope it's clear how we get the solution. Now, so, uh, let's consider what happens if we consider a different order. If we consider a different order, order this one, then this set is not a Grobner basis. Instead, we need to compute the Grobner basis and we know that the Grobner basis will be, so it's already computed. And what was the third polynomial? I just don't remember. Uh, ah, y squares is this, yeah, y square z minus y z square. Okay, it will be uh, y square z minus y z square. So this is your Grobner basis. These are the leading terms. And now we want to reduce we want to compute the reduction of our polynomial. And as you can see, our uh, well, it's, well, we can reduce our polynomial with respect to this set. I mean, it's not, it's not a remainder because we can reduce, for example, the first um, monomial. So, okay, let, uh, let's proceed. Well, let's try to do it in this, uh, using this thing. 
So we, for example, we can reduce it with respect to G1. We actually can use G2. Um, so both options are um, valid. So we may, so how do we reduce this? So we, we consider this part minus x square y minus y square. And here we need to multiply by z. And because of that, we can cancel this part. And the result will be x square plus z y square. And now this one is not reducible with respect to g. So this is a remainder. Shouldn't it be not just z but x z? Uh, uh, where? Uh, yeah, here. No, uh, this is our our polynomial x cube y z plus x square. So this is just our polynomial. We take our polynomial and we subtract g1 multiplied by something. So this is our polynomial minus something times g1. So here it's exact. So it must be exactly the same as here. Yep, I mean, but before the break, it we have coefficient z shouldn't be x z because the proof, like x to the power to the third power, not to the second. Oh, oh, you're right. You're right. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm getting too old. You're right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I I didn't notice that. That's my mistake. Thanks a lot. You're right. So yeah, so here we have x squared plus x z y squared. And now, as you can see, you cannot read, uh, oh no, you can reduce it using this polynomial. You can proceed with reduction. It's not a remainder. And that, that was a mistake here. It's not a remainder. You can even proceed with reduction even further. You know. What this is what happens when you wrote a review to twenty four uh, term papers during the whole night. <clears throat> okay, so this is the first step of your reduction. Now, um, is it possible to reduce this one? As you can see, here we have y square z, and we can reduce it with respect to g three. So let's apply g three. So here we have x square plus x zy square minus what is g3 this is this guy we need x yeah we multiply by x so the sign yeah the sign is correct now so we cancel this term and as the result we will get x square plus x y z square and I, and i believe this one is not reducible so this is a remainder yeah, it's uh, it's not divisible by any of the leading terms. Okay, so this is a remainder. Okay, so and now um, the um, so the answer to the question is exactly the same. This polynomial is not in our ideal, so it doesn't belong to the ideal. But as you can see here, the solution was almost instant, like. We didn't compute anything. Everything was obvious. It was obvious that the set is a Grobner basis. It was obvious that the polynomial is not reducible. Uh, so it's a remainder. But here, when we uh, in the second case, uh, because of the choice of the order, first we have to compute. So first of all, we have to do all these computation from this uh, part in order to find the Grobner basis. And then we need to um, uh, find the remainder of this polynomial because this polynomial is is not a remainder anymore in this case. So as you can see, the problem can be significantly harder if you choose uh, well in appropriate order. Well, if you, for example, in this case, if you need to solve the membership problem, well, just take a look at your problem, and if you see that some specific choice of, of an order may simplify significantly your computation. Just use these specific order. Don't hesitate to use some specific order in order to simplify your work. Well, but 
if you see no specific difference between um, different orders, just try any you wish. Uh, probably you will guess and this order uh, will give you the less uh, painful computation. But if you can see that some order is much better than the other ones, try this one. Okay. Now I have a question. Yep. I have a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why do we have a note that something is not a Schrodinger basis? What again? We have a note. We have a note that something is not a Schrodinger basis. Oh, uh, the uh, uh, here is the note. If we take this order, then this set is not a Grobner basis. For what? It's not a Grobner basis for which ring? For this idea. But after the lecture, we decided that uh, ideal is uh, ah, it's ideal is a Grobner basis, but not the set. Uh, what again? I mean, you showed me that I is a Grobner basis for itself. Yeah, but no, ah, no, I mean, not the whole set I, I mean, the set of two polynomials given here, G1 and G2 is not a Grobner basis. The two polynomials G1 and G2, they do not, okay, let me be more precise. Um, uh, when I write, when, I, when I'm saying is not a Grobner basis, what I mean, I mean the set consisting of these two polynomials. So this set is not a Grobner basis if you take this specific order. Okay, and what is I? Well, I is the ideal generated by these two polynomials. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, no problem. So here, uh, well, again, the choice of the order may be crucial uh, for the computational complexity. Okay, let's try to solve some other problems. Let's try another membership problem. Okay, let's go down. Okay, yeah, I remember I should draw a line, uh, wrong color. I should draw a line here, here the, the horizontal line. Let's take Q of X, Y. This is our polynomial ring. And our ideal will be x square plus xy plus one comma xy minus y square. So suppose this is our ideal. And a polynomial we want to test is two x square y plus y. So we want to check if a polynomial f belongs to the ideal i. Okay, let's try doing that. First of all, we need to fix an order. Well, here we have two options. Uh, the option number one is lexicographical order where X is higher than Y. And the option number two is lexicographical order where Y is higher than X. Okay, let's try, let's find the leading terms with respect to both um, orderings. Well, the leading term here is x squared with respect to the blue order, and the leading term here is x y. Well, the end of co prime, uh, it's not very interesting. Let's try the other one. For the other one, we have y square here and x y here. They're also not co prime. So, well, here it's not obvious which order to use. In both cases, we need to uh, to do some computation in order to check if this pair of ideals give you a Grobner basis or not. So let's stick to the first order. I believe it should, it should be fine to use the, the blue one. So let's stick to this order. Let's fix this one. Okay, so now let's check if this, so let me recall the algorithm. First of all, we need to find the Grobner basis of this ideal. Currently the ideal is generated by two polynomials and we don't even know if this set uh, of if the set of these two polynomials is a Grobner basis or not. So first of all, we need to find the Grobner basis. So let's compute the, um, 
let's say this is G1 and this is G2. So let's compute S polynomial. What is the S polynomial? So uh, in, in this case, uh, the least common multiple of the leading terms is X square Y. So we should multiply the first polynomial by Y and the second polynomial by X and subtract one from another one. Uh, so these allow us to cancel the leading terms. And as the result, we will get x, y square plus y plus x, y square. And this gives us 2x, y square plus y. Ta-da! Actually, <laughs> as you can see, this coincide with the polynomial f we wanted to test. And since S polynomial belongs to the ideal, now the, we know the answer. Uh, during the process of computing uh, an S polynomial, we, we have computed what, uh, well, the required part. But let, let's pretend that we didn't see that S polynomial coincides with the polynomial we want to test. OK, so in this case, um, uh, so we just want to check if this um, uh, set is a group number basis or not. So we have computed the S polynomial. Now we want to check if it's if this one reducible to zero or not. So we can we cannot reduce this polynomial using the first one, but we can reduce it using the second one because this term is reducible by um, X and Y. So we can reduce this term by uh, by the second polynomial. So we have 2xy squared plus y, and uh, we want to reduce it by the, sec the second polynomial. So we need to multiply by 2y. Yes, I I'm correct. So these cancels uh, the monomial we wanted, we wanted to cancel. And as the result, we will get y plus two y cube. And one, this one is not reducible by uh, any of the polynomials. So now we need to extend this set by this one. And the leading terms here are these. Now, we want to check if this is Grobner basis or not. So these are the old polynomials. So we just need to check the old polynomials, as polynomials of the old polynomials with the, with the new one. And this is the new one. So these are S polynomials that we wanted, to, that we should check. But when we check uh, S polynomial, as G, uh, let's use a different color, as G1, G, G3, we see that the leading terms are co-prime. So these S polynomial will be reducible to zero with respect to G1 and G3. So we don't need to compute this. So it's okay, this, uh, this S polynomial is reducible to zero. So the only thing we need to check is uh, S polynomial of the second and the third polynomial. So S G2, G3. In this case, we will get XY minus X square to Y cube plus Y. So what is the least common multiple of the leading terms? It's X, Y cube. So we need to multiply by Y square here and by X here. And also we need to cancel the coefficients. So we need to put two here and consider the difference. After, after doing that, what do we get? So we, will, uh, so we will cancel the leading terms and we will get uh, minus two y to the fourth minus x y. Okay, now uh, let's check if it's reducible to zero or not. First of all, 
we see that we can reduce this term using G2. And let me uh, skip the computation. Well, actually, uh, when we reduce by G2, we replace xy by y square. So after reduction, we will get uh, minus 2y to the fourth minus y square. And now I see that I can reduce this part using G3. So let me write it down here, minus 2y to the fourth minus y square, and I can reduce it using G3. G3 is 2y cubed plus y, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. So how do we reduce that? Well, actually, we need to, uh, um, we need to multiply, uh, we need to uh, add G3 times y. So we actually reduce, we replace the first part. So this part will be replaced by y squared. So the result will be zero. I just want to um, um, skip uh, some computations. I hope it's clear what I'm doing. So after this reduction, we will get zero. So S polynomial G, uh, of G2 and G3 also reduces to zero. So it means that this pair is also okay. And this set is a Grobner basis. Uh, by the way, you see the initial polynomials uh, depends, depend on X and Y. And uh, the new polynomial depends on Y only. It doesn't depend on X. It's an interesting effect. So now, if we want to up, uh, apply the algorithm in order to test the membership problem, so let me recall, we were trying to solve the membership problem in this case, and we want to check if this polynomial belongs uh, to the ideal or not. So now we want to compute the remainder of this polynomial with respect uh, to uh, the Grobner basis. So let me write this down here. So I just want to recall that the Grobner basis we have computed looks like um, x square plus xy plus one. The second polynomial was, um, what is it? Uh, xy minus x square. And the third polynomial was 2y cubed plus y. This is our Grobner basis. And these are the leading terms. And the polynomial we want to check, we want to test is 2x square y plus y. So now we want to compute its remainder. And here uh, we have two options. We may reduce it with respect to G1 or with respect to G2. Well, now uh, I would suggest to um, reduce it with respect to G2. Why? Because you see, when you, res when you uh, uh, reduce with respect to this polynomial, so you replace this expression by minus tail. But when you reduce using this guy, you reduce this expression by minus tail of this polynomial. But here tail consists of one summand and here tail consists of two summons. Well, it's easier to deal with one summand uh, rather than with two summons. So I would rather, rather reduce this with respect to G2. So what will happen here? Uh, so I should multiply by 2x. And because of this, I will cancel this term. And as the result, we will get y plus 2xy squared. Now, um, I want to reduce this guy with respect to g2 again. So we'll get y plus 2xy squared minus xy minus y square. And here I should consider 2y. Yep. And yes. because of that, yep. Any questions? Yeah, I mean 2y. Yeah, 2y. So the result will be this. 
And this is actually G3. And using G3, we will get zero. So, and as we can see, th this polynomial F belongs to the uh, ideal generated uh, by these two polynomials. Well, actually, we have already seen that because, well, because of some, well, we were lucky. And while we computed the Grobner basis, we saw that, uh, well, S polynomial of G1 and G2 is of this form. So, um, well, well, if the question was, can you uh, answer this question? Does F belong to I or not? Well, you can stop the proof at this point. Since you computed S, uh, this polynomial and it coincides with the required one, you see that this polynomial is represented as this one times Y minus this one times X. So just by definition, this one belongs to the ideal. So at this point, you could stop and, yet and answer the question. Uh, what, uh, what I was trying to show you here, that uh, is the way how a computer can, um, solve this problem. So the computer usually uh, compute the Grobner basis. It gets this um, list of polynomials and then it makes the second computation, it computes the remainder. Well, since we're human, we can uh, use these tweaks. Like if you see something um, during your computation, for example, oh, we're lucky as polynomial coincides with the polynomial we wanted to test. Then you can give the answer right here. So uh, the rest of the computation is unnecessary, but this is how they, they should look like. Okay, so this is the membership problem. Um, I, well, uh, it's a good exercise to repeat this computation using the other uh, order. You may check what, what will be different if you use a different order. Uh, well, it's an interesting question whether the computation harder or easier. So, well, it's, it's a question. Okay, so let's skip to a different problem. Let's switch to, to a different problem. Uh, um, I want to compute an, an intersection of an ideal with a polynomial subring. So the, uh, the other problem was this. So we know an ideal, which is given by G1, GK in a polynomial ring. And we want to intersect this ideal with a polynomial subring uh, generated by fewer amount of variables. Let me recall how to solve this problem. First of all, you fix a lexicographical order with the following property. You want the, the variables from this subring to be strictly smaller than all the variables outside of this uh, subring. Okay, so any lexicographical order with this property is, um, is an appropriate one. So now, uh, uh, then, you compute the Grobner basis, so you take the generators and you compute the uh, using the Buchberger algorithm, you compute uh, the Grobner basis and suppose it's denoted by, by G. And uh, the answer will be G0, where G0 is the set of all polynomials from G depending on X1, Xk, where G depends So this is um, how it should be. Okay, so uh, so this is how it works. Let's try um, uh, these on example. Well, first of all, we may apply this to a previous example where we had i to be x square plus xy plus one, xy minus y square in q of x, y. And let's try to intersect this ideal with the subring generated by y. Okay. So how, um, how should we do that? First of all, we need to fix the lexicographical order 
where y is less than x. This is exactly the order we used in order to compute the Grobner basis. So this is the first step. The second step, we need to compute the Grobner basis of this idea. And we know that the Grobner basis consists of three polynomials. We have already computed this. And here it's 2y cubed plus y. So this is the Grobner basis. And now, in order to find the generators of this intersection, we need to choose uh, elements of the Grobner basis depending on y only. We have only one um, polynomial in the Grobner basis depending on y. So the set G0 consists of 2y cubed plus y. So this guy is generated by 2y cubed plus y. So this is the answer. So this is how it works. Are there any questions regarding this? Okay, um, let's, uh, tr well, actually an interesting question is to intersect I with the other subring Q of X. Uh, for doing that, we need to compute a Grobner basis for this set, but with a different order. So if I want to intersect I with Q of X, um, I need to change the order. Let's try doing that. I don't know uh, what is the answer. I didn't even compute this, but let's try doing that. So um, let's try to intersect the ideal i with the polynomial ML ring q of x. Oh yeah, by the way, I forgot to mention one thing. What happens if here the set is empty? Well, it may happen that when you compute here the Grobner basis and all the polynomials depend on variables uh, from this list, from this part of this list. So the set of polynomials depending on x1, xk is empty. Then g0, g0 is empty. But if g0 is empty, this simply means that this intersection is a zero ideal. So uh, let me, so let me write it here. So a remark, if g0 is empty, it simply means that the intersection is just zero. So empty set generates a zero ideal because you consider like empty linear combination combinations. Well, I mean, it should be by definition that empty linear combinations generate a zero ideal, but somehow the intuition should be clear that if you have no ideals, then you must have at least zero one. Okay, so um, let's try to compute the intersection with Q of X. So in this case, we need to specify the, uh, the other uh, order. Now we need to make Y to be higher than X. In this case, uh, the leading terms will be different. So in this case, this will be the list of generators. And these are the leading, uh, the leading terms. Again, I can replace this polynomial by minus this polynomial. Multiplication by a constant doesn't change anything. So let me recall, this is, the, so this is our initial ideal. I can replace the, this polynomial by minus, uh, minus this polynomial and they still generate the same ideal. So I just want the leading terms to be one. Okay, so now we need to check if this is a Grobner basis or not. So, so we need to compute the Grobner basis with respect to this order. Um, okay, uh, so S polynomial of G1 and G2 is what? Um, okay, so these are the leading terms. Uh, so uh, the least common multiple is X, Y square. So here we need to multiply by Y and here by X and subtract. So as the result, we will get y x squared plus y plus x squared y. So this is 2x squared y plus y. Okay. And now we want to reduce it with respect to our polynomials. Let's reduce it with respect to g1. We have no other option. 
xy plus x squared plus one. And um, here we should use two x. Then we can cancel this term. And as the result, we will get y minus two x cube minus two x. And uh, that's it. As I can see, these polynomial E cannot be reduced with respect to uh, the polynomials we are given. So, okay. So now we need to add this guy to the list of polynomials and we will get xy plus x squared plus one, y squared minus xy. And here y minus two x cubed minus two x. Okay. And the leading terms here are these ones because y is higher than x. Again, uh, so this is the list of the old polynomials. I'm sorry. And this is the new one. So we need to compute s polynomials of the first one and the third one and of the second one and the third one, the first and the second case. What happens in, in both cases, we have to compute them explicitly because as you can see, they are not co-prime, so we have to compute. So what is S polynomial of G1 and G3? This will be XY plus X squared plus one. And here we have Y minus two X cube minus two X. Well, um, we should multiply this by X and subtract one from another one. So, we cancel the leading terms. And what remains is x squared plus one plus two x to the fourth plus two x squared. So we will get two x to, x to the fourth plus three x squared plus one. Ta-da! Um, and as you can see, these, po these polynomial cannot be reduced to zero. So this is a remainder. Okay. Uh, what about, so we need to add this polynomial on the second, on the next step, on the, on the third step. So now let's try to compute S polynomial of G3 and G2. So here we have Y square minus XY and Y minus, 2x cubed minus 2x. And we should subtract here the second one multiplied by y. If we do that, we cancel the leading term. And we will get minus xy plus 2x cubed y plus 2xy. And this will be 2 x cubed y plus xy. Um, just in case, um, uh, give me one second. This will be, two x, okay, it, it's, okay. Well, I, well, we can actually, well, we can actually reduce this guy to zero. Uh, well, it, it's probably not very obvious, but uh, yeah, I believe this one can be reduced to zero. Um, why? Well, because, well, okay, let's, let's try doing that. So I believe using uh, the first one and the third one polynomial, we can reduce this one to zero. So let's use G1. So we have two x cubed y plus x y minus, what is g1? g1 is x y plus x square plus one. And we multiply by it two x square. Am I right? Yeah, it seems that I'm right. It's correct. So what, what we will get, we will get x y minus two x to the fourth minus two x square. And then we need to reduce um, 
Okay, uh, we need to use the third polynomial, which is this one. We can, we can reduce here the, um, uh, the letter y using polynomial g3, uh, which is y minus 2x cubed minus 2x, if I am correct. Yeah, it's written here. So when I do that, you see I replace y by this tail, so the, the first monomial become 2x to the fourth plus 2x squared and minus 2x to the fourth minus 2x squared, which, is, which came from here. And the result is zero. Yeah, so this polynomial is reducible to zero. And the only um, re uh, interesting remainder here is this one. So we need to add this remainder to this set. So let me do it like that. I just want to copy the set. Okay, and we need to add our new polynomial here. Which is what? Uh, which is uh, 2x to the fourth. Okay. Oh, y disappeared here. 2x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus one, or what? I just can't remember that. Okay, so, and here, as you can see, this is the list of old polynomials, and this is the new one. And the leading term here is this one. And we want to compute um, S polynomials of the new one with the older one. But you see, when you, when we take a look at these S, polynomial, uh, S polynomials of these two pairs, the living terms here are co-prime. So we don't need to consider these S polynomials, they will be reduced to zero automatically. So the only S polynomial we need to, uh, to consider is this one, the S polynomial of the first and the last one. And I believe if I compute these S polynomial, it will be reducible to zero. So I can see that I have like minus three minutes left. So let's try doing that. Yeah, and this is an example where the Buchberger algorithm doesn't stop after the second step. As you can see, here we have the third step. So here we have something like this, to the fourth plus three x squared plus one. We need to multiply this by y, this by x cubed, and uh, by two x cubed, and should use the subtraction. Uh, then we cancel these terms and we will get 2x to the fifth plus 2x cubed minus 3x square y minus y. Yeah, and here we need to use uh, g3 in order to reduce this. So let's use g3. When we use g3, it means that we replace y by, uh, well, let me do it like this. I, I just want to save some time. So I just do it uh, simply like this. 2x cubed plus 2x minus 2x cubed plus 2x. So this is what happens when we, when we apply this reduction. Oh my God, it doesn't, it doesn't give me, it doesn't give me zero. Okay, so it, and the process doesn't stop, as you can see. Well, uh, I suggest to, okay. Um, so uh, that's, that's not good, but okay. So what happens next? So as you can see- uh, Yes, well, should be minus there. Like again? We need, we need to put minus two X cubed minus two X. Minus two X cubed, no. Uh, I have already subtracted uh, the, require, uh, the required poly polynomial. This is what we will get here, actually. So there, there is no mistake with computation. I, uh, I just use some other option, uh, well, some um, other uh, way of thinking here. But as you can see, the result is non-zero. This will be a polynomial depending on X. Oh yeah, but uh, this polynomial is probably divisible by this guy. 
So we will get something like this, um, minus four X to the fifth because of this, then we will get um, minus six. Okay, let's do it like this, minus six X cube from here, then plus two X cube minus two X cube and plus two X. So we cancel this and now, yeah, and now this guy is, is reducible to zero with respect to the new polynomial. Uh, so as you can see, if you multiply uh, the yellow polynomial by two X, by minus two X, we will get exactly this. Um, um, Actually we have all positive items in the G3 or somewhere, yeah. In minus two X. What again? Uh, yeah, is it it's, minus? It, it's minus, it's minus two X. It was a mistake again. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not the best computer in, in the world, as you can see. So when we use G4, it will become zero. Yeah, so this is the, uh, the sequence of computations. And as you can see, this is the Grobner basis and this polynomial uh, de um, defines the intersection. So I intersection with Q of X will be 2x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus one. Whew. Oh, uh, in, in round brackets, because it's not a set, it's, it's an ideal generated by this polynomial. So this is uh, the answer for the second intersection. So this is how the algorithm works. Okay, are there any questions regarding uh, this problem? Okay, just in case. Let me recall that the problem we were trying to solve is how to intersect an ideal with a polynomial ring. So we choose an appropriate uh, lexicographical order in such a way that all variables here are the smallest one. So here, since we have just two variables x and y, I just pick this order and then I compute the Grobner basis and I should uh, take a polynomial depending on, well, the, poly, uh, the polynomials from the Grobner basis depending on the on variable X. And this will be the answer. So this is how it works. Okay, that's more or less everything uh, that I wanted to explain today. If you have any questions, please ask. Okay, if there is, uh, is there I have yeah. A question yep. about the well, test. Uh, okay. So you said there will be no demo variant, but maybe at least you will kind of send us the structure of it, like how many tasks we have, how many points do we get for each task? Well, um, okay. I believe there will be eight tasks for uh, one task for each uh, subject we, we covered during uh, our lectures and seminars. And more or less the demo um, version of um, the test is your homework. Uh, I, there will be no tasks uh, during the test beyond the scope of your homework. So if you know how to solve everything in your homework, you will be able to solve everything during the test. And how long will the test be in terms of Okay, um, well, I prefer to... Uh, uh, well, to use like three hours. Usually it's enough time to, to solve all the problems. Well, technically I, uh, the test cannot be longer than two hours and 40 minutes, but if you don't mind, and if you need more time, then uh, it can, it could be like three hours, but I would like to, uh, uh, the test to be three hours. If it's okay for you, if it's not very long. And uh, for example, in homeworks, uh, especially in the first ones and in the last one also, they were like sometimes very difficult, not difficult, but very long computations. Will okay. the tasks on the test be the same or they will be like, because for example, comparing from the tasks with the seminars. Oh, I, okay, I, okay, okay. The technical difficulty of the tasks uh, during 
the test will be simpler uh, because you have less time than during the homework. I'll try to make all the uh, problems um, easier in terms of technical difficulties. And we can use calculator only? Yeah, my, you, you can my... use calculator only. I mean, like, um, it's online, right? Yeah, it will go online. And we use calculator, like, I mean, like, on our computer or in our hands, like, uh, like. Well, you can use the uh, the app, uh, calculator as the application. It, it's uh, it's not prohibited, but you are not allowed to use any uh, computer uh, programming languages uh, and libraries uh, like Python or Sage or any software like Maple because all this software just can solve all the problems in one line. And for example, uh, online matrix calculator or one needed for? No. Oh, okay. uh, well, first of all, matrix calculator doesn't help you here, but it's not allowed. Okay. And uh, I didn't really get when is the test. What again? Uh, when is the test? Okay. Um, I'll send you an email um, during till the end of this week and I'll tell you when the test will be. Well, the test will be during the, uh, the next week. Well, I wanted it to be on July, on June 12th, but June 12th is the holiday. So uh, yeah, and I, I found this uh, very late. So I'm, I wasn't prepared to, cha to change the date. So now I, I'm, I, I have to find an appropriate date. So the holidays kind of ruined my plans for the test. So that's why I didn't tell you um, uh, the, uh, an appropriate date. So currently I'm, uh, in, uh, well, well, I'm searching for an appropriate date because it's quite hard to uh, find a window for the test at the end of the year. And uh, so it it might be before the last uh, lesson, next third, right? Yeah, it, uh, it it may it may be it may happen that the test will be before the the last uh, lecture. It, it it doesn't it doesn't matter. I mean, the the, uh, the last lecture will cover the proofs, all the required um, uh, well, all the required tasks. Uh, will be given during the, uh, well after this seminar. So I mean, all the homework will be given today. So you will see all the tasks that you need to know how to solve. Well, if if you well, I mean, uh, if you have some suggestions, for example, if you want the test to be after the uh, next lecture, just tell me. I'll try to organize that. If you. If you in like if you want the opposite, if you want the test to be as, as soon as possible, then also tell me. I'll try to organize that. I mean, I'm open to any suggestions. It's uh, it's okay. Like uh, for me, it's more or less doesn't matter when to organize the test. I just need to find the time. But if you have any suggestions or any preferences, just tell me. Well, tomorrow evening he'll be fine. Tomorrow evening? Yeah. That's not a good idea, actually. That's not <laughs> the <good>. best idea. <laughs> Please let it be tomorrow evening. <laughs> well, but there must be, uh, well, an appropriate window of time between the moment I tell you that uh, the date of the test and the date of the test, like at least a couple of days. Well, I believe it, it would be fair. <laughs> so that's why it's not happening uh, this week. So it will be on the next week. But okay, in any case, if you have any, any preferences or any suggestions, uh, but you're not ready to uh, tell them now, you may write to me your email or telegram and, and tell me uh, what you think about the date of the test. So, and yeah, by the way, uh, uh, it's very important to find the date uh, with no collision. So if you have some other tests or exams during, uh, well, it's good to know the, the appropriate dates. So just tell me your options if you have some preferences, no problem. Okay, uh, any other questions? 
Well, I have a question. Uh, during <laughs> some task, during the seminar, you gave you gave a tip, uh, but I didn't get it. Like, if s polynomial is divisible by something, yeah, it's, if it's zero, then something could be repeated. Uh, okay, let's. It will be hard to remember what was it about exactly. You said that uh, the following computations are redundant, and if something inside, we just. Oh, okay, 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 okay. No, I see what you mean. Okay, um, it was here. So we wanted to test if this polynomial belongs to this ideal. Okay. What's written below is the straightforward application of the algorithm. Okay? okay, but there was a remark. You see, during the first step of this algorithm, we computed this polynomial. Uh, how, how do we check it in general? If I want, if I want to check whether my oh. algorithm is an ideal. Okay, so in general, the algorithm is the following. So it's it's done here. So you choose an arbitrary order. Here, for example, we choose this one. Mm -hmm. Then we can we take the generators of this ideal and we compute the Grobner basis for the, for the set of generators using the Buchberger algorithm. This is exactly what we did here. As you can see, we have computed the Grobner basis, so this is the Grobner basis. We extended it by one, okay. and then what what we should to do? We need to compute the remainder of the polynomial f with respect to the Grobner basis. And this is what we did here. We, we choose this polynomial and we reduce this with respect to G2 several times and one with respect to G3 and we will get zero. So okay. if remainder is zero, it means that F belongs to the ideal. And if remainder were not zero, it would mean that F doesn't belong to the ideal. Okay. But um, uh, the trick, uh, well, uh, the remark here was the, uh, was the following. As you can see, uh, uh, during the first step of computing S polynomial, we see that the S, uh, this polynomial coincides with the S polynomial of these two polynomials. Okay, and that's why it will be- in Yeah, that's why way. it belongs to the ideal automatically. So we don't need to proceed. But I just wanted to demonstrate the whole procedure from the beginning till the end, because, well, you, you, will, you won't be always that lucky. Okay. It's some kind of um, miracle that, it happens here. And the polynomial that we get is intermediate step. It's it's not a remainder. It's like, we, I mean, uh, we we got uh, 2x y squared plus y. And this is not a remainder. It's an intermediate step. step we still can um, reduce oh. it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so, uh, by the way. Uh, oh, oh, it's a different polynomial. I, I confused it. Uh, you're right. Oh, you're right. Uh, I'm, I'm an idiot. It's a different polynomial. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, it's, it's, it's awful. I'm, it's, yeah, you're right. It's, it's a different polynomial. I, I, I thought it's exactly the same. I, I just confused two polynomials. You see the power of Y here uh, is two and here the power of Y is one. Yeah, so the, the hug doesn't work here. Uh, I was mistaken. Yeah, you're okay. Well, and they that's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if they were the same, we can just say that. Yeah, yeah. If they were the same, you you could say that. Okay, now we can stop. It doesn't matter. So the polynomial is the same, and so you don't need to compute. But yeah, here the polynomial is not the same, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was a mistake, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens when you don't sleep during the night. <laughs> okay, and I have two more questions from okay, the okay. last uh, seminar and the last lecture. Okay, Could you, open you want this? me to open the previous seminar? Yeah. I didn't get the proof of the last, the very last sem seminar problem and the very last theory from the lecture. It was sent. Uh, should I start I know, from I the guess. lecture or the seminar? Let it be lecture. Okay. 
So let's start from the left. The very okay. last. The very last theorem. Okay, so uh, the claim at the end. Okay. Okay, so let me recall. Um, should I recall the claim itself? Mm, yeah, why not? Okay, so uh, we have, um, well, the polynomial ring with the fixed order. We have a set of polynomials and an arbitrary polynomial, and we um, uh, start the process of elementary, well, and we do elementary reductions of f with respect to g. So, and this is the sequence of elementary reductions. I want to prove that this sequence holds. So the process will terminate at some point. Okay. Okay. So how do I do this? I suppose that the contrary holds that the process will never terminate. Okay. So if the process will never terminate, if the process never terminates, um, then uh, well, this is what I what I'm doing. Uh, so um, let's let's take a look at the sequence. Uh, of, of polynomials in this reduction. I, uh, well, I can write each polynomial in this form where m uh, i prime, well, not prime, m i one, m r one are monomials and uh, the letter c stands for coefficients. So the letter m stands for the monomials and c stands for the coefficients. So, and mm -hmm. this is the leading terms. So now what I'm saying that the leading terms uh, sh should go in non-increasing order. So the leading terms are either the same or uh, the leading term of the next one is strictly smaller. So why is that? This is because we know how the process of reduction works. When we, uh, when we go from one F1 to F2, we make an elementary reduction with respect to G1. What does it mean? It means that we fix a monomial here and reduce this monomial and cancel this monomial and uh, using G1. So if this were, uh, if this is a monomial somewhere here, so we, does, we do not touch uh, the leading term, so it remains the same. But if we reduce the leading term, so we, re we replace the highest monomial by the sum of smaller ones. So the highest monomial in the new sum uh, will be strictly smaller uh, than um, the initial highest monomial. Okay, so M1 returns the leading monomial. What again? M1 of F returns the leading monomial, right? M1, yeah, M1 returns the leading okay. monomial. Okay, yeah. and so, we claim that's... So this is just the notation, a fancy way of uh, referring to this guy. So this guy okay. is this one. So what I'm saying here is that these guys are going in and um, non-increasing order. But these guys, I mean the red ones, uh, the red guys um, are monomials and we know that every strictly descending chain of monomials terminates. So this means that in this pro procedure, uh, there, there, uh, we can find uh, a moment of time, like uh, there is some K such that all the leading monomials will be the same starting from this point. Okay. Could you repeat it please? Wait I mean, this sequence cannot be strictly descending because we know that every strictly descending chain of monomials terminates. Okay. It was in the previous claim. Okay, and our assumption was the, like, the opposite. But no, it's it's still not a contradiction. It, uh, so we consider just the leading monomial. So it means that uh, when you consider the leading monomial, at some point the leading monomial will be the same. So so here they uh, may change, but finitely many times. And then for the remaining sequence, starting from some index k one, um, we uh, we will see uh, we will find that the leading monomials remain the same for all the polynomials starting from one point. Why? Because there is no um, strictly infinite, uh, infinite uh, strictly descending infinite sequence of monomials. So this sequence is not increasing. It cannot be strictly decreasing. Inf so because it contradicts to, to another another claim. Okay. Okay. 
uh, which was somewhere here. Okay. Okay. So now, um, so again, so uh, let me summarize what's going on here. So when you consider this infinite sequence of reductions uh, and you take a look at the leading monomials, after some amount of steps, the leading monomials remain the same and the leading coefficients also remain the same because okay. uh, you, you, don't, you, you do not make reduction. It means that, uh, let's say from the step K1, all the leading monomials with the leading coefficients, so all the leading terms will be the same. Now I take a look at the second highest term in all the remaining polynomials. Okay. Yeah, we will get the same. But yeah, we will get the same. Point. So after several amount of steps, um, we will we will find that uh, um, all the polynomials will have two terms, at least two terms, and these and these two terms will be the same. But since the sequence is strictly descending, they must have other terms and they will be different and then they will be uh, organized in the other way. Okay? Yeah. So, and then we repeat this procedure. And as you can see, uh, so these, um, uh, so let's take a look here. So what did we do? We actually find, first of all, we, we have found a monomial M1 star, which is, this, uh, uh, this, uh, the monomial, uh, the common monomial uh, for this infinite sequence at the first place. Then uh, from some point, we, uh, we have found uh, the monomial M2 star, which will be common second largest monomial in all the polynomials starting from some point. And, the, and because this monomial appears in, uh, in the same polynomial with M1 star, this guy is strictly smaller than this one. Okay. And uh, 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 you why see, is it so? Hmm? What again? Why M2 is less than M1? Because by definition, this guy was the, the largest uh, term in this polynomial. Oh, okay, okay. So this is the second largest, this is the third largest. But we know that after stabilization, this, this monomial doesn't change. So, so we, pr we produce a monomial M1 star, then monomial M2 star, then we can proceed and on the third place, we may produce a monomial M3 star, which will be strictly smaller than M2 star and so on. If the sequence never terminates, we can repeat this procedure, procedure infinitely long and we can find okay. a sequence of monomials of this form and the sequence will be strictly decreasing and infinite. And okay, this contradiction. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, because when I was looking uh, for the proof of the theorem, I found only, uh, I understood everything until this was last, the last green line and just yeah, oh, yeah. lost so, after that. Oh, okay, yeah. So here I just, uh, you see the process above uh, allows me to produce the sequence of monomials mm -hmm. and now it's just a contradiction. Yeah. Okay, and quickly, could you get them on another the line? Seminar. No, 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 no. Could you open is this the same lecture and quickly, briefly go through the proof of the theorem that uh, the on the right uh, claim on the right? Yeah, this one. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Uh, during our yeah. discrete mass course, we know the uh, least number least number principle. Yeah, but I think it's kind of similar. But what's the basic idea for the proof? Oh, the basic idea is exactly the same as it was in the previous claim. So I, I suppose that this sequence is infinite and I uh, go to a contradiction, but actually, so let me explain it in, in, in more details. So uh, consider this descending chain and suppose that in, uh, um, in my lexicographical ordering, X1 is the highest variable, X2 is the next highest variable and so on, okay? Okay. So just um, for simplicity, it doesn't change anything you just reorder your variables and then this property holds. Now, um, since M2 is strictly smaller than M1, then uh, the degree of X1 here must be larger or equal than degree of X1 here, okay? So, um, and this happens for all, uh, for, for the degrees of X1 everywhere. Okay. So, but now we get as a, a non-increasing sequence of integer numbers. 
positive in, non negative integer numbers okay okay and if we assume that uh, the system never holds uh then they are equal yeah so from some point in uh well let's say from step r uh, all the degrees of x1 will be the same okay and the same for other variables yeah and, and now uh, yeah since we compare lexicographically now we since this guy is strictly is larger than this guy so for these powers we have exactly the same argument and then they stabilize us and so on and so on okay okay got gotcha. you yeah okay thank you and the last question about from the last problem from the seminar I, uh, uh, this seminar or the previous seminar the previous seminar it, you you have already explained it to me but I didn't get, like what have we done okay give me one second i need to move the whiteboard even if it's black um no 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 it was in the, somewhere in the top oh, it was some uh, but i modified um uh, uh the lecture notes I, well I, I can share the screen ah yeah it was should be here yeah this part yeah so um yeah if g divides f then f is reducible to zero with respect to g we we consider the remainder and the lead like the product of leading element leading elements and what yeah. oh uh okay so let me tell you the the general idea what i'm proving here is this if f is divisible by g and you reduce f with respect to g then the result of the elementary reduction is also divisible by g yeah so if you can prove this, so let's assume that we, we know how to prove this. Okay, yeah, I, I see the proof. It, it was, it's with two red lines, yeah. Yep. The remainder is divisible, and then we know that. So the proof is here. Ah, ah okay, yeah, okay. So if F is divisible, and uh, by the definition, what is F prime is F minus CT times G, where C is a coefficient, T is a monomial, and mm -hmm. G is a polynomial. And you uh, substituted it here, and you see f prime is also divisible by g. Okay, okay. and uh, yeah, this part is clear. Uh, but so now, you, now we want to prove that the remainder is zero using this property. Okay, let's compute the remainder. Because of this property, remainder must also be divisible by g. Okay. But <laughs> well, if um, remainder divisible by G, uh, you can reduce it. Yes. Because, and this is written here. So if R is equal to H times G, then the leading term of H times G is uh, to the leading term of H times the leading term of G. So this is the leading term of this product. And the leading term is divisible by the leading term of G. So by definition, you can reduce this term we can reduce yeah so if r is a product of h and g then the leading term of this product can be reduced by g yeah but we can reduce everything uh, since it's reducible and it's not so important to be like divisible for example g plus one we can also reduce by g no why no, no okay we can reduce it but i mean um what is, what is important here is a contradiction that we get. We assume that R is not zero and okay. divisible by G. And if it's, so it's, uh, well, by definition, R is, uh, is a reminder. So by, uh, by, by the procedure, R is a reminder. So it, uh, you know, what does it mean? It means that you cannot reduce R by G any further. And now okay. we prove that you can do at least one reduction. Okay, so and this yes. is a contradiction. By definition, R is a reminder. Is a reminder can be reduced by G, but we prove that it's divisible by G. That's why it can be reduced by G. Yeah, if it's divisible and it's not zero, then you can find uh, a monomial divisible by the leading term of G, so it's reducible by G. So it's okay. a contradiction. 
would be in the remainder. Okay, now it's totally clear. Okay, okay. Th thank you very much. No problem. For the lecture, for the explanation. Yeah, I think that's all. Okay, then have a nice, have a nice day. And Thanks you have being. a nice weekend. Yeah, bye. Bye. bye.